Um, yeah, it's even my both my studio building and my apartment building. Um, I would say the studio building I just heard today it has I don't know 100 places that there are at least 20 available, and my apartment building is 40 percent empty. Oh wow! Yeah, that's very unusual for New York. Right, right. Hi, Mark. Hi, everybody. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hi, Mark. I'm going to go finish shucking my cord. So we have about 11 participants. We've got some people who've already come on. So we're live. OK. Um, so we go, we go boop when we want to <laughs> Hand signals is actually easy for us to follow, so okay. you don't have to go boop. <laughs> go, go next, next slide. Your, your color looks better today, Mark. You're looking a little uh, pale. <laughs> you know what I discovered, which is weird? Zoom has this thing that says, you know, enhance your image. Oh. And it had been on. And I went and turned it off, and I look much better with it. With it <laughs> Which proves that you don't need to be enhanced. <laughs> I wonder if it would enhance my image in life. It would be that would be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> not not for you, but you know. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I insist for me. For the Zoom <laughs> You've done you've done these seminars before. Have I done one? No, I mean Rockwell has done has done. We've been doing programming online, and it's one thing that's nice about it, of course, is that you know a lot of times people who wouldn't ordinarily be able to to come can participate. So that's always a, a great plus. Even though we we love to see people in person, um, it's a it's a good second alternative. It's it's actually had some. Some nice um, pluses. Actually, I did some PR on this today, and among other things, I sent it to the children's. There's a Society of Children's Book Authors and Illustrators. Oh, thank you! And Wonderful. I, and I and there are many chapters, and I sent it to like maybe ten. And one of them was in England, where I've given lectures, and I got an email, and the woman's like, "I'll be there," and I'm like, "Oh, oh wow!" She, she thinks she'll be here. It's like eleven. It'll be eleven o'clock at night for. No, it'll be that's 10 o'clock, 1030 for her. So. That's great. Yeah, thank you for thank doing you. that. Yeah, that's terrific. Good idea. Hi, Liza. How did your five o'clock drawing uh, go? Hi, Liza. Good, thank you. I drew about uh, Jacob, uh, the, the man that was shot in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed funny. your... You're drawing last night for the convention. Oh, thanks. <laughs> they helped me keep my head on. <laughs> well, where, where can we see those? Well, thanks. Um, I, I usually I collect them on Medium, my blog platform, but they're on uh, Instagram and Twitter. They're on Twitter immediately as I do them, and then I re repost them later on Instagram. So, I'm not sure I follow you okay. on Instagram. I'll have to do that. Are you on, Mark, are you on Instagram? Yes, yeah. I found you on Twitter. I never figured out Twitter. I don't know, I, I never kind of figured out how it, Okay. How it works. <laughs> sounding like really old guy. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> I think some it people me like it, it and I just happen to like it. But, but your Instagram thing, uh, just your name, that'll get me to you? Ellen, how are things up uh, in your neck of the woods? Um, good. Uh, we had a little rain today off and on. We've had a lot of rain mm. overall. And so all the plants are doing great. And so it, it's, it's beautiful right now. The sun's out. There had been a little bit of rain. It's cooling off a bit. It's heavenly, I would say. Uh, Eliza, your, your voice breaks up a little bit, uh, if, at least from me. Everybody else seems pretty clear. Um, it, it kind of comes and goes. Does anybody else notice that, or is it just me? 
I noticed it. Yeah. A little bit of breakup. We don't have great Wi-Fi in this in this rural area, and I remember to turn off all my devices before I do a Zoom because it, it uses up the. Where are you? Right. Where are you? Where are you? Uh, uh, just outside of Rhinebeck. Oh. That's where all those old stomping grounds. Yeah. yeah. I used to stomp over to their house off the <laughs> <Really? laughs> I mean, If they didn't have good Wi Fi. Where are you, Mark? I'm in Great Barrington, a few blocks from Elwood. Oh. We've become okay. neighbors. We knew each other in New York and then didn't see each other for many years. And then all of a sudden we're in the same town. Wow. We don't see each other at all. No. <laughs> Except on this. Quite a while. You were in Lenox last I remembered, Mark. So did you move to Great Barrington? Yes, because I was driving to yoga every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. I might as well just live here. And um, we had to downsize anyway. So it's good. I love being here. Yeah, it's good. Mark, you... is, is, yoga, is yoga on Zoom now or is it? Um... Yes, it is totally on Zoom. Uh -huh. Which has is good and bad. I mean, the nice thing is you can just roll out of bed and you're there. You don't have to, you know, prepare anything. But it's I miss being in a room with a lot of people doing it. Yeah, for sure. That that part is is missed. Mary, are you are you do you do it anymore? Are you doing any yoga? Uh, not so much Ashtanga anymore. Nope. But um, doing other things. Ashtanga, whenever I tell someone I was doing Ashtanga, they say, oh, that's the one that everybody gets injured doing. <laughs> you know, I, I loved it. I yeah. loved it. Just, just, uh, what, is I, that? what is that? I don't even know what that is. It's a, it's a yoga practice. That, it's a set series that's 90 minutes long. Oh. And it's very vigorous. It involves a lot of mindful breath, but a, a lot of movement. And um, it's very addictive when you're doing it. And then when I, what happened to me is I became a, I went from teaching to being a school administrator and I just had no more time. Yeah. But are you still doing the primary series like multiple times a week? I'm doing, I'm doing it. Uh, I've been doing other things as well, but at least once or twice a week I do it, but I, I've had two knee replacements. So I'm oh, very geez. modified. <laughs> But that's know. why I'm not going to do yoga. <laughs> that's dangerous to me. Yeah, I thought it was supposed to be healthy. Yeah. <laughs> no, do you have to reset your arm sometimes? <laughs> yeah. No, so I'm doing kind of a poor version of Ashtanga at this point. Skipping a lot. How about you, Stephanie? How's your yoga? You know, I, I, have, I have never done yoga, but it looks extremely relaxing. <laughs> I think Zumba is fun. Yes. But that's, not, that's not happening right now either. Uh, and Roxy gets exercise walking from one side of the city to another, right? There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really trim when I lived in Manhattan, walking from 21st and 3rd all over to various places like New York Times. It was great. Well, no, nobody has a car, you know, so we have to get, and nowadays with this, with the, uh, you know what, <laughs> it's just better to walk. Better to walk, yeah. The only person I knew that had a car was Jim McMullen. <laughs> I <laughs> try to get him to take them places. <laughs> That's funny. We've got three minutes. Um, in the country thinking, well, I'll be in the country, I'll get all this exercise. And I had no exercise because we drove everybody everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> Always driving. I think I've known Elwood the longest of all of you. I knew, knew you before Roxy. Elwood, when you, you and I were starting out as illustrators in the city, I don't know, early 80s perhaps? Did we meet there? I know, I know as soon as you and Michael moved to um, Rhinebeck, we got together, but uh, well, I, I knew you, I knew of you, let's put it that way. 
we must have been at some of the same gatherings and uh, Michael was the elusive one. <laughs> and I heard of him from Alexa Grace. Was a, yes. Yeah. He lived on a property she owned or something. I just want to mention, we yeah. just got the nicest message from um, C. Davis on YouTube who's watching from the Great Lakes and is really excited to uh, be with you guys. Hey. So we thank you, C. Davis, for joining us and everybody. We're very close, aren't we? What time is it anyway? We're very close. We've got about two oh. minutes. We are live on YouTube now. Um, we're recording. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we have friends who can't make it it's live. They'll be able to watch it later on YouTube. Yes, we'll post it on our YouTube channel. And I actually had a couple of your friends emailed me today, so I let them know that was the case. Okay. I might or might not regret that. <laughs> 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 Don't make a fool of yourself now. <laughs> right. let, me, let me do that. <laughs> I told my five o'clock live drawing group uh, on Instagram about this, and a couple of them are migrating, migrating over. They said they were. That's great. Nice. Thank you. Everybody's welcome. Yeah, I, put it, I put it on Facebook, and some people responded they were going to do it. Usually, people often don't respond, but they they show up, so. Yeah. You in your studio, where's your studio? And, uh, where's your studio now? My studio? No, oh, Roxy. Oh, Roxy. Sorry. Uh, in Long Island City. Okay. You know, where, you, uh, yeah, you know where Silver Cup is? I'm right across yes. the street. It's like right there. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, they have some offices in this building. I, I love it over here. It's a great place to be. Okay, so we are going to start rolling. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Mary Burley. I'm the Chief Educator at the Norman Rockwell Museum, and we are so happy you are here with us tonight for Finding Funny, Artunists, and the Picture Book. I'm here today with Stephanie Plunkett, who is the Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Museum, and four celebrated illustrators who a very broad range of work among them, um, but also do incredible children's books. We are with Ella Wood Smith, Roxy Monroe, Mark Rosenthal, and Liza Donnelly. Um, behind the scenes, Rich Broadway and Alyssa Stubel of the Norman Rockwell Museum will be managing some of your questions and um, working to keep the program rolling. We invite all of you to enter questions into the question and answer and chat boxes. And where we can, we will elevate people to ask questions personally. Um, YouTube viewers, we also welcome um, you to put questions into the YouTube chat box and we will um, bring them to the meeting. Um, we are recording this event and we will use it uh, for school programs and other other things in the future. Additionally, we will post it on our YouTube channel. Um, so with that, we just are, again, just so happy you're here and excited to explore how these wonderful illustrators have fit creating books for children uh, into their um, remarkable uh, bodies of work. And with that, Stephanie Plunkett will uh, introduce each of the artists. It is a great pleasure to introduce these amazing artists and I'm going to tell you just a little bit about each one. Hopefully you'll all be able to see the images as I do that. Liza Donnelly began her, begins her day by checking major news outlets like CBS, CNN, NPR, and Twitter. And she later creates and shares digital drawings inspired by the day's most pressing events. And you can catch that at 5 p.m. each day. Her cartoons have been featured in The New Yorker, where she has been a staff artist since 1979, on CBS News, NBC, CNN, and in Forbes, Ms., The New York Times, Fusion, Medium, Narrative, Politico, 
The Daily Beast, The Huffington Post, and many others. Liza has given a TED Talk, and she has spoken at the United Nations on behalf of Cartooning for Peace, an organization that invites cartoonists to open the dialogue about democracy and freedom. A self-described feminist, Liza is the author of Funny Ladies, the New Yorker's greatest women cartoonists. Uh, cartoon Marriage, created with her husband uh, and fellow cartoonist Michael Maslin, and Women on Men and other cartoon collections. Dinosaur Day, Dinosaur Garden, The End of the Rainbow, and A Hippo in Our Yard are among her colorful children's picture books, and her work is currently on view at the Norman Rockwell Museum and will be here until September 27th if you're able to make it over. Mark Rosenthal's inventive graphic illustrations appear regularly in such national publications as Time, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, Forbes, Fortune, The New York Times, and The Boston Globe. In addition, he is a New York Times bestselling illustrator of many books for children, including the Bobo series written by his wife, Eileen Rosenthal, who I think is on tonight, Small Walt, The Runaway Beard, where on Earth, a geography guide to the globe, the straight line wonder, and Fooey, which he wrote himself. Mark is also the creator of To You, a national traveling exhibition produced in collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution and the National Geographic Society. Published in 2016, a child's first book of Trump, which Mark illustrated, is up for discussion tonight. <laughs> Roxy Monroe is the author and illustrator of more than 40 nonfiction STEM and STEAM and concept books for children, many using gamification to encourage reading, learning, and engagement. These include Mayscapes, Amazement Park, the Inside Outside books, uh, including New York City, Washington, DC, Texas, London, and Paris. Um, uh, flaps, uh, feathers, flaps, and flops, doors, gargoyles, gardens, and glass, ranch, maze, circus, maze ways, and um, this really sounds fun, and she's going to talk about it tonight, I think, dive in, swim with sea creatures, and their actual, at their actual size, and many others. She's also created interactive children's book apps like Roxy's Maze and has been commissioned by CBS, The Washington Post and the Associated Press. 14 of her paintings have been published as covers of the New Yorker magazine. And of course, last but not least, the wonderful Elwood Smith, who is an acclaimed humorous illustrator best known for his whimsical comic characters and intelligent inventive drawings, which have appeared on the covers and pages of Forbes, Fortune, Time, Newsweek, Bloomberg, GQ, The Wall Street Journal, The Chicago Tribune, The New York Times, and many others. Sony, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Pizza Hut, Hut, Pizza Hut AT&T, McDonald's, and Bell Atlantic are among his many clients. And Stalling, Hot Diggity Dog, See How They Run, The Truth About Poop, Raise the Roof, Bug Muldoon, and How to Draw with Your Funny Bone are just some of his illustrated books. Elwood has also explored the world of animation in creative 2 and 3D productions, and he is musically gifted. He has been playing guitar since the late 1950s and composing his own songs. His whimsical transfer drawings, uh, which actually are created just for his own enjoyment, will also be shared during this presentation. I'll just mention that um, Elwood's World, uh, some of you may remember this, Elwood's World um, was an exhibition that was presented at the Norman Rockwell Museum in 2011, and it was an enormous hit. And we are fortunate at the museum to hold what we like to call the world's largest collection of art and archival materials by Elwood Smith. So with that, I'll just mention that we will invite each artist to take us through a series of their own work. 
And we'll start with Liza Donnelly, but we invite your questions and comments throughout. And as they come in, we are very happy to pose them to the artists. So uh, Liza, would you like to begin? Sure, um, that's me. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> yes, next slide, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. Thank you. Um, th this, uh, this is an example of my, my cartoons for the New Yorker. I've been working for them since 1979. And uh, this, is, this, this one is one of the more popular cartoons that I've done for them. It's, uh, it just was reprinted and reshared e even recently. So, it, and I forget when it was drawn, but it was probably in the 90s. Um, anyway, it's a simple black and white. The New Yorker doesn't use much color, as everybody knows. They have had some color cartoons and I've published a couple of color cartoons for them, but um, this is typical New Yorker style cartoon. Um, and I, uh, you can do the next slide, I guess. Um, I, uh, is another example, fun can happen to adults too. It's one of my favorite cartoons of my own. I just like it because it's, I like drawing these big trees. I think I was influenced by George Caraman, Crazy Cat, the way he draws his trees. I draw my trees like this. And um, uh, I just like the idea. The swings, they, I draw a lot of swings. I like drawing cartoons that sort of cross over into childhood and I like putting you know, using that metaphor to talk about life and how, how it, we, I mean, I think it's, as cartoonists and illustrators, we have to remain childlike in a way. I don't know if you guys agree with me. Next slide. Liza, I wonder if you want to read that uh, caption just in case people can. Mm -hmm. um, Therapist is saying, so you're a Democrat and you won. How does that make you feel? This was done for the New Yorker back in uh, when Obama won the first time, won, won for president, because we had had such a string of Republicans in office uh, that it was shocking to many Democrats. And um, I, uh, I like to do cartoons for the New Yorker. I, I've done a number over the years, and this is a typical New Yorker political cartoon back in the 80s, 90s, and two early 2000s. Now, they're, now they have an online uh, political cartoon every day that is much more, much less subtle. The, the, the work that, I haven't had any online, but um, for them, but they have some really, really uh, strong cartoons on their, on the newyorker.com that are much less uh, um, polite, <laughs> let's put it that way, <laughs> um, than, than the ones typically in the magazine. So this one, also I'd like to point out that I made it two women just because I can. <laughs> um, you can do the next slide. Okay. Uh, this one obviously is more, is very recent. And it was, I, I started working digitally a lot uh, on my iPad. I tried the Wacom tablet, which is another device for those of you that aren't in the art world. It's another di a digital device to draw on, on a screen. And, um, but I really prefer drawing on the iPad and I do a lot of my drawings on there now, although the New Yorker work is always on paper. And this was done when the coronavirus took off in March and I just thought it's a global thing and we all have to care for each other and put our arms out. So sometimes I try to do these simple visual drawings and, and normally, I mean, nobody published this except uh, Twitter. <laughs> Twitter and Medium, my, my blog platform is on medium.com and I can publish whatever I want there. I get a little bit of, of money from that, but it's more like sharing my, my work and uh, getting it out there. And this one was reprinted um, thousands of times, I think, not reprinted is the wrong word. It's been shared thousands of times on Twitter, different, different United Nations and different countries used it because it's, it's, it's obviously nonverbal, so it's an easy thing to and it also became the really the logo for the, your exhibition, which I think yeah, it's nice. Thank made you. perfect sense. It's such an inclusive. I, I learned a lot of I learned a lot about doing captionless. I mean, although I started my career doing captionless drawings without words, because um, that's what I liked to do um, for the New Yorker. But since my connection with lots of international cartoonists, uh, I've learned. From there, watching their work and studying their work, how um, 
powerful and, and uh, rewarding it can be to do a visual uh, idea like, like this mm -hmm. uh, without words and it can, tra it can travel around the world. And that, I learned a lot from my friends and colleagues from abroad. So. Next one. This was actually uh, just shortly after 9-11. Is that right, Liza? Yeah. I didn't think I could be a cartoonist anymore. I, I didn't know it was funny. I couldn't, a lot of people were examining their lives, and I was, too. So I, I, but I drew this, and the New Yorker bought it and printed it a couple months after 9-11, and I felt like, okay, I'm back on track. So I, I did a lot, a, lot of, a lot more political cartoons after this. And the sandbox is a format that you sometimes use uh, with children which, who have um, kind of unending wisdom themes. It's great. Yeah, they, they, they say things that they, they don't, they're so innocent. And it's, uh, it's uh, I love putting words in children's mouths in the sandbox particularly. The one on the, 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 one, um, on the left, I don't know if everybody can see the one on the left with the mom standing there. Uh, he says, she says, uh, we have no plan, Mom. We're occupying the sandbox. <laughs> this, this was done, and, and the New Yorker didn't buy it, and nobody bought it. Um, it was done during the Occupy, Occupy Wall Street period, and I was just using the word occupy. In a different, that's often what cartoonists do. They take, they take the words and just put them in a, an unusual setting, and that's, that's what makes it funny. And the one on the right is uh, another one that I really like of mine because it's playing, it's talking about gender in a sort of guised way, you know, like, I don't see liking trucks as a boy thing, I see it as a liking trucks thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was really influenced by Charles Schultz growing up. I watched, I read Peanuts daily uh, in the Washington Post and um, loved Peanuts. It was like Peanuts was my, my strip <laughs> as a kid and uh, Snoopy in particular. But I, I just loved the way he used their voices to say something deeper sometimes. I didn't make the connection when I drew this, but I, I think I, I think I was heavily influenced by Schultz. And we just happened to have a letter that you wrote to Charles Schultz when you were a little yeah. girl on the wall of the museum, complete yeah. with, yeah. with uh, peanuts illustrations. Fan letter to Charles Schultz. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, kind of get into a little bit about your picture book, and I wonder if you want to say how you got involved in jumping from cartooning to picture book art? Early in my um, career in the 80s, uh, I, I had start, I started, people said you should do kids books and I, I kept putting it off. I didn't really know, I didn't know how to do that. I, I mean, I, so I, I, but I had an idea. So I, I made a dummy, which is uh, a fake book on, on cheap paper, you know, I mean, staple it on my end. It's a dummy, it's a dumb, dummy book. And um, telling the story of a little boy and, and how he discovers under the snow repeatedly, and he's with his dog. And um, I, I found an agent, I met an agent at a, at a party and she, she liked the idea. So she took it around and she, and Scholastic liked it. And they liked the idea. And um, they said, well, would you mind making your monsters into dinosaurs? Because they, they knew how popular dinosaur was. Dinosaurs were. So took off uh, right, right at the cusp of it. Um, and I said, sure, because I actually worked at the Museum of Natural History when I was in New York, early, early days. And uh, so I, I love dinosaurs, I love natural history. So I created these books for Scholastic. Um, and they're all about this little boy and his dog and their fascination with uh, Actually, the little boy is fascinated with dinosaurs, but the dog is not so sure. You can see that in his, in his face on the left. <laughs> the little boy, the dog would rather stay home, but the boy keeps going out and like, let's go do this. And he knows everything about dinosaurs. And, and, and the, these books are for five, six-year-olds, early readers, and they have very minimal words, um, very visual, which is what I had hoped to do, is make visual books that were less about the words. I have a quick question. Was this published in Asia? I know some of the um, text looks like it's, I don't know what. what oh. Where are you seeing that? Uh, the last one? Yeah, those, no, that was, uh, that was Dinosaur Speak. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
think. <laughs> That's a, I it's a good language. No, I really did make uh, like, it's a it's a fake it's a fake language for the dinosaurs. In some of the books, the dinosaurs have that language, and it's just my uh, scribbles. We have a side note on this, though, Mark, which is that in the museum right now, one of these images is on the walls, and children have no problem translating language for their parents. <laughs> now, I, when these came out, I was visiting schools all the time. I know, I know Roxy's done that a lot, and I know probably you guys have too, but it's really fun to, to meet with the kids and talk to them about, about the, what you do. Oh, that's really fun. And this, these, these two are from a book, more recent book called uh, Rainbow, End of the Rainbow. Um, and this time, I decided to make a little girl and her cat in their adventure, uh, looking for what's at the end of the rainbow. Um, and what's I find this interesting or useful to know is that I did these dummy, I did dummies of this book and the next book we're gonna talk about. Um, back right after the dinosaur books finished, I did seven of those dinosaur books. When they finished, I did these dummies and my agent tried to sell them but couldn't get anybody to buy them. And then 10, 12 years later, an editor at, at Holiday House approached me and said, you, you know, we'd love to work with you. And so I showed her these, these dummy, these old dummies and she bought both of them. So never give up hope, <laughs> always keep trying. That's a really great message. Um, I think one of the things that's kind of fun in the exhibition is Liza actually uh, handed me a, a folder full of rejection letters from the New Yorker. And I think uh, maybe one thing you might talk about is, is how hard is that to you know have ideas and not always find a place for them to go. Well, I know all of us on this panel know what that's Everybody's like. Gone through that. We have to do, well, with the New Yorker, we do six to 10 ideas a week. We mean all New Yorker cartoonists. And um, they, they might buy one. They might not buy, buy any and for weeks. So you're constantly producing material um, that never sees my day. And, but what do you get, really? That's, that's usually the case. So... Um, um, rejection is just part of the part of the mix. You know, you're always putting stuff out there, right, guys? You're just always producing ideas, and hopefully, somebody, hopefully, you find the right person that will want to buy it or use it. If I might add to that, uh, the uh, How to Draw with Your Funny Bone book and another one called I'm Not a Pig in Underpants both sat around forever, and occasionally we pitched them, and then everybody would say, "Now, love the art; it's not for us." Uh, and that went on for years, many years. And then one day, uh, uh, the uh, I don't know if any of you know Rita Marshall uh, at Creative Company, the Creative Company, and ah. they, bought, they bought two of my books all, almost immediately. They had been rejected by everyone, and uh, I, I'm so delighted that they're published. But it it, it takes a yeah. while. And it takes exactly the right person that is in sync with your voice. Yeah, it's the right person, yeah. And this is the other one, the Hippo and our early reader that Holiday House bought. And uh, it's about a little girl. Again, this is a little girl. I decided now I had to do, do, do books about girls um, who uh, saw, saw animals like hippos and lions or tigers and uh, zebras in her backyard and nobody in her family believes her. But in, <laughs> The zoo had, had broken down and they, they all got loose, so they were in a backyard. It's a uh, really wonderful story. And I think, um, Liza, I think you've always got such positive messages and hopeful okay. messages in your book. Nice colors. Thank you. Yeah, I learned my colors by studying William Steig. Mm -hmm. Big fan of, of William Steig's. We are as well. We've got a great well, collection of work here. Yeah. Uh, I have, we have a really interesting question that came in from uh, YouTube, Brian Bowes, who uh, actually, I believe, teaches uh, at Savannah College of Art and Design. He's a wonderful wow. artist himself. Mm -hmm. And he asks, uh, would the illustrators be willing to share their thoughts on how to keep from over-intellectualizing their work while creating? <clears throat> That's a real artist to artist question, I'm thinking. 
I can I can safely say it's because I have a low intellect. And <laughs> easy as could be, I, I I don't intellectualize anything I do. I don't give that a moment's thought. I'll hand it over to the people, New Yorker cartoonists who do. Well, sometimes I've noticed when you have an idea or an assignment and you're maybe even on the phone listening to the pitch or the idea or um, you can just sketch it out. And sometimes that very first sketch, which you do kind of intuitively and really fast is the best. Yeah. And you'll think about it and you'll redo it, redo other ideas and you keep coming back to that very first intuitive, spontaneous, done so fast you don't even have time to do it well. And a lot of times that's the best, the, the final idea. I, I agree, Roxy. When you're trying to think of a cartoon, like for the New Yorker, it's it, sometimes your brain gets in the way. So you have to, that's why, you, you know, I work, I have a big piece of paper on my desk or, or sketchbook and I have words and doodles and stuff. And sort of, you just sort of sit there with them and, and let your mind wander um, and, and hopefully a wonder to an idea <laughs> but if you try to force it, it it looks forced and doodles are i was reading something actually in the new yorker about boredom they had this article i think it was only on the web this week about boredom and it said how good doodling is because you know you're engaged but you're not bored because you're doodling and a lot of times that gives um like when, with my maze books i mean all my doodles look like mazes so <laughs> but uh, but um, just doing something intuitively, again, it's not intellectual, it's just fun. I want to know how you guys come up with your children's book ideas. I don't really know how I did these two, um, but I don't, I, I don't know how to, I'm not, it's not my main job, so it's, I, it's, it's sort of a mystery to me how to come up with a children's book idea. Mm -hmm. I find the thinking part of the brain comes in later you know, the initial thrust, the initial inspiration, it doesn't come from that part of your brain. And, but then it's, it's nice to be able to like step back for the second phase and look at it critically and then, and then maybe make some intellectual critical choices about how you want to refine whatever you've done. Yeah, first you get the idea and then a lot of times you're like, you rethink it and you're like, this is not going to work. But um you kind of make, you can kind of make it work and you kind of um, find out that it that's the challenge to, kind yeah. of pu yeah. to pull it off because sometimes you don't think you can you know all of a sudden you're like well I can't do this I can't pull this off but you can there's it's kind of a uh, elliptical thing <laughs> well that was a wonderful question and and Liza you kind of use the other side of your brain with your historical research uh, into the history of the field, which has been very important to you. Do you want to say a little bit about Funny Ladies? It's yeah, um, back in 2000, yeah, um, I, I started writing this book, Funny Ladies, with Prometheus books. And um, I mean, I, I started first. Yeah, no, they, they contracted me and then I wrote it. Um, it's a history of the women, women cartoonists at the New Yorker from 1925 to 2005. So, these, there were women in the first issue of the magazine, which I was happily surprised to find out. And I, I spent a year in the archives at the New York Public Library researching these women. This was before the internet was really easy to use. And so I, I just did a lot of going through manuscripts and, and letters. It was, oh, I loved it. It was, I, 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 it was great. So um, I, was, I was happy to discover these women and their work. Um, and I'm gonna do a, I'm I'm gonna do a new edition with uh, Prometheus. It's coming out in uh, next year with all because there's there's a whole bunch of new women now since I wrote this book. The New Yorker has had a lot more women cartoonists uh, publishing their work, and um, I want to write about that. So, Great. Just about that. thank you. Yeah. Uh, before we get to Mark, uh, we have another good question from YouTube, which is. What is the element of illustration that helps to make cartoons for children universal across race and ages? Anybody have a sense of what makes for children universal? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, there's the element of play and fantasy that um, all children uh, 
care about and get engaged in. Yeah. That, that doesn't have any, any race and doesn't have any uh, time attached. To and it. children are kind of universal uh, in the way they play throughout the world. You know, Amer American children are no different from children in the Philippines or children in China or anywhere else. They play with the same kinds of things and have the, because playing helps you um, learn how to deal with the world, as you all probably know, creates, con you know, helps you problem solve and uh, resolve conflicts. Even animals play, as we know, like tigers, they learn to fight that way. So children learn, I think, and of course, Fairy tales, as people believe, are a way to deal with the terrors of life. So that's, I mean, fables and that sort of thing, which can be very violent, mm -hmm. um, are helpful in allowing children to deal with the evils and the complexity, complexities of life. So Roxy, I feel I'm making a connection between what you just said and the, the, what, what cartoons for adults do for adults. They do the same thing. They, I guess, allow us to Cope, learn to cope with what's going on, like particularly now. Yeah. I think editors spend a lot more time thinking about that topic than illustrators and cartoonists. I, I think we just, we draw, we don't give a lot of thought to that. We imagine that because we grew up loving imagery and we make imagery that it automatically will be enjoyed by any age. Uh, I, I've never tried to gear it toward little kids or anything else, but editors step in and have very strong opinions about that and make the kind of changes that uh, makes it difficult for the illustrator, but sometimes probably better for the project. So, uh, When you're editing. making your books, do you have, do you tend to have a child or a group of children in mind or are they, or are you channeling your own inner child? Inner child, for me. I. I um, I'm the only child I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are great. Mark. One, one quick thing about uh, making it universal. It's not a bad idea to use animals as your characters. Because anybody can be an animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a bad way. <laughs> Mark, I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit about how you got into illustration and um, what direction you took. Well, I kind of backed my way into illustration. Actually, I, I, I had studied architecture in college and then discovered that I liked painting way more than architecture. So I was a painter for about eight years and then moved to New York City to, to paint and thought I'd make some money to live by illustrating and I got some gigs at the, at the Village Voice, which was you know, a great place to, um, uh, you know, to get little, little spot things to do. And I got a job with Milton Glaser, which was, uh, most of you probably know who he is. He's sort of seminal designer, illustrator, uh, just passed away and um, kind of found my way into the illustration world that way and found that I I couldn't do illustration and paint at the same time because they were too closely connected. Uh, and uh, so I ended up just being an illustrator. And, and I, what I liked about it, it was that painting was pre-using one side of my brain, kind of a, almost like a non-thinking side, a very intuitive side. And I kind of enjoyed the illustration side because it used the other side, the kind of rational side. and and the balance of the two felt good to me, so. And you often, I think, um, use images and words in, in both your picture books and your illustrations. This might be an example. I wonder if you could say a little bit about what we're looking at. Yes, <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> uh, this is essentially a comic strip, which is a medium I'm pretty comfortable with because I've been drawing comic, you know, little comics since I was a kid. Um, this was done during the impeachment hearings. Remember those? It, it, it <laughs> feels like, uh, another lifetime. Um, but at the time, I was kind of fascinated by the quick cycling of um, excuses and explanations for what I considered 
basically treasonous behavior. And I just kind of made a note of, of all the different sorts of explanations that came and went. And I wrote them all down and then just put images with them that, that seemed to explain them. And like any, any good comic strip, it uh, ended with the sort of the punchline, which was... <laughs> Uh, I, I, I bother you just to read your captions just in case people okay the, fir the yeah. first one the little girl i have no knowledge of this and <laughs> the second one didn't happen and the dog what about the cat <laughs> it with his hand in the cookie jar everyone does it and the woman's going get over it <laughs> with his foot on his desk no big deal and then finally the cat away the canary says uh the Ukrainians did it. <laughs> when I first saw that one with It Didn't Happen, which I, I love that one, I thought that was a, a, a dead dog <laughs> on his feet. <laughs> <laughs> so this image is an editorial illustration. And I should explain that an editorial illustration just means that it's an illustration done for a magazine or a newspaper. And illustration to me is different. It's not the same as fine art. Uh, it, it's not of itself and for itself. It has a, a purpose and it has an agenda and that's to communicate something, communicate an idea, a feeling, something specific to an audience. So, you know, it has a job to do. Um, when I get an illustration assignment, most of my work, most of my career was done, was, was doing editorial work. And uh, the way that tends to work is the illustrator will get the text, a manuscript of an, of an article or an essay and read through it. And it's often, for me, they were often very complex and very dry. And I would read through it a few times and boil it down to one sentence, one concept, maybe a phrase or a sentence that, that encapsulated the main thrust of, of the article, and then find an image that expressed that as clearly and as simply as I could. And uh, so, so this one was uh, an article in a business magazine uh, about some stocks behaving uh, poorly, uh, specifically alcohol and tobacco stocks, uh, and they are known uh, sometimes they're known as the sin stocks. So that gave me the handle for this illustration. Okay. What's the medium, Mark? What, you, what, have you, what did you paint with? This is digital. I mean, I used to work in watercolor. Uh, you used to be an oil painter in the day and uh, I used to work in watercolor, but now most uh, publishers and, and magazines want files delivered digitally. And I thought I should just do them digitally instead of trying to like reproduce yeah watercolor in digital format. So I've, I've learned how to, to get textures and you know, different effects in using digital media. I, I always start with pencil. I always start with a drawing and then it goes from there. That sure looks like tempo. Wow. So this, this is, these are also editorial illustrations. The, uh, the same approach applies to this. The one on the left was an article about uh, sorting and hierarchy, about data, looking at most of the articles that I'm asked to, to, to uh, illustrate are pretty dry. So this was about data sorting. And the way I approached it was thinking about when you're sorting something and creating a hierarchy, it's almost like a connoisseur. And I was thinking of a cigar connoisseur. So he's, he's like, you know, rating and, and uh, laying out whatever, whatever those things are. Uh, <laughs> some kind of hierarchy. Uh, the one on the right is, uh, was for a review of a newly released uh, version of Strunk and White's Elements of Style, which is sort of the Bible of writers. Um, and the essential idea I got from that was that uh, simple is better than complicated. Great. The one on the left is another editorial illustration, and it was um, about, about communication, which is you know, actually the essential thing in illustration, but it was about miscommunication, about not understanding, maybe uh, not, uh, not speaking the right language or misunderstanding your audience. 
And either way, it felt to me like the idea of a round peg in a square hole communicated that idea as clearly as I, as I, you know, as I could. Now the one on the right is, uh, was a poster and it was done at the time of the family separations when migrants were come to the border and these kids would be separated from their parents. And I pretty much thought about the, this poster the same way as what is the clearest expression of the horror of having child and parent separated. The words uh, also came came from my, you know, my sensibility of the, this is this is my America and this is done in my name. That's that's how that came about. Yeah, it's amazing how emotional that work is, uh, despite the fact that it's graphically very clear and um, and simply simply done. But I'm sure it took you a long time to get to that point. It's kind of like poetry. Did you have a lot of uh, other solutions to something like that? I had other variations. I mean, I think it was important for me to make it anonymous and not have a caricature of the guy carrying the kid away. That it was, you know, it was he's this nameless big guy separating a mother from from her child. And um, I, I found that I think I steered away from having like poor kids behind barbed wire, which you know I think there are a lot of images like that around at the time. But for me, the the, the the thing that got me emotionally was that moment when your kid is taken away from you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So leaving politics, uh, <laughs> book covers, I was um, given the opportunity to do covers for a series of books by P.G. Woodhouse, one of my favorite authors. Um, he's a humorist writing in the 20s and 30s. And stylistically, I was trying to make the covers reflect that that time period. Um, he, he's best known, I think, for his Jeeves and Worcester books. So uh, Worcester, Bertie Worcester was a sort of hapless upper class Brit, um, not the brightest bulb on the tree. Yeah. Uh, Jeeves was his butler who was, you know, very wise, all knowing and, and would often would always kind of rescue Bertie from wh whatever mess he got himself into. So that's Jeeves, that's Jeeves down in the right corner and, and Bertie is in the, blue, in the uh, green jacket. And this particular book, The Code of the Worcesters featured, this was done in the thirties and it featured a, uh, the head of Britain's fascist party. Uh, so I tried when I made him, he's the guy, you know, jumping up and down. In the back of my mind, I was trying to make him graphically somehow relate, uh, not too obviously, but to relate to a swastika and the kind of angular graphics uh, I hope would do that. Plus he has a little Hitler mustache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so kids books. When did you begin uh, your journey with children's books? Um, my wife and I were friends with an editor at Knopf, and she asked me to, to maybe do an, a kid's book, uh, illustrated kid's book, and that kind of got me started, and I found it really rewarding. It's a totally different time frame. Illustrate The illustrations I was doing for editorial work were you get the story on Monday, you need to sketch by Tuesday, and then you need to finish by Thursday. So it's you know really quick turnaround. You know, kid's books take a year, I'm sure as you guys know, it would take, you know, maybe a year to, to come, come out. And um, I kind of like, like that leisureliness. And I also like the, the, I think because publishing doesn't pay as well as other, other forms of illustration, they, they compensate by treating you like an artist and they give you a lot of freedom. <laughs> um, that, that's pretty much how I got into it. But then I, 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 these days I'm doing uh, a lot of children's books. That's sort of like my, my, main, my main thing. Has that been everybody's experience that children's books allow you a little bit more artistic uh, legroom and, and freedom? Well, one thing is that nowadays with so many, with illustration no longer being used for fashion and in advertising very much. To me, the most creative illustrators working right now are in children's books mm -hmm. because there's really uh, uh, nowhere else they can go very, you know, other than maybe 
And of course, cartooning has, as you guys know, there are less um, opportunities and less publications for cartooning. So I think there's very, very creative work being done in children's books. And again, as Mark said, the editors, um, they want you to do that. They encourage you to be uh, eclectic and wild. And so it runs the gamut from super realism to absurd to all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So there's some wonderful work in children's books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, Mark, what's this one about? Uh, well, before I get into that, I just have to say that the, the approach for me in a children's book is exactly the opposite from an editorial book. Editorial, you get a long article and you, you're winnowing it down, you're distilling it to its essence. A kid's book, you're often given um, text that is very minimal. Maybe, maybe a whole children's book is one page of, of text. And your job is to expand on it, to kind of bring more into it, bring a whole world into it and also give kids who might want to read the book or have it read to them more than once, stuff to look at, um, you know, it, it, on the second and third time of the reading. Now, this book is uh, the third book in the series of about this uh, plucky, young, little snowplow, small Walt. Um, it, very charming, written by Elizabeth Verdick. And um, this particular book, he has uh, rescues a puppy, a small dog that you can see on the cover. Right now he's heading back to his lot at, towards a, after a day of plowing. And you can see all the big snow plows who, you know, in the first book, they're, you know, pretty disdainful of him, but he, he you know, he shows his worth and plows mm -hmm. through, so. Mark, do you have a favorite children's book that you've created? I, I know my kids grew up with your work and. Yes, <laughs> and in fact, one, one, of the, one of my, books that I wrote is is totally um, based, you know, like the feel and the flow is based on this. I, I love um, Babar, love the whole universe. I love the way it's told, uh, it's something that really resonated with me. I mean, there are a lot. I love Harold and the Purple Crayon and, um, you know, the Mike Mulligan stories. And, and my favorite, well, the, my favorites are probably the ones I grew up with and probably ones that were written in the 40s, 30s, 40s you know, 50s. This one has a very Babar feeling, Bobo. Uh, Bobo, so Bobo was, was a, a different experience. So normally you get a manuscript from the, from the author if you, if you hadn't written it yourself. And it's just a page of typewritten text. And the first thing that I would do is break it down into pages because uh, children's books are typically 32-ish pages long. So you look at the text and you figure out how the page breaks will go. What will be a two-page spread? What will be a one, you know, page turn here? What will be spot illustrations? And you break it down that way. Now this book, uh, my wife wrote. She wrote the, all three of the Bobo books. I must have Bobo. This is I'll Save You Bobo. And then there's Bobo the Sailor Man. Bobo is that sock monkey lying down there. And we worked on these together. We would go to a coffee shop and she would, you know, say a line of text and I would draw a picture as she was talking and we would kind of go back and forth. And sometimes a picture would suggest a different turn to the story or, you know, we would go back and forth like that. Um, so I just had to say, this is really a different, unusual way to do these books. This particular book, he, uh, the hero, Willie, is making his own picture book about Bobo. And he's saying, um, he's saying um, Bobo, you'll have a scary adventure and I'll save you. Once upon a time, we were in a jungle. Everything was really big and green. So you can see what he's picturing in his mind. And then at the same time, he's drawing his own picture book. Wonderful. Is there going to be another Bobo? Uh, so far, no. <laughs> I would love to her. We had some in the wings, but we'll see. Uh, so this this is the first book that I, I wrote and illustrated, and it was called Fooey. And it was um, it's basically a Rube Goldberg device. I know Ella would, would certainly know about this. Maybe other people other people do. Um, it, it it's it starts with this um, this young kid who you can see in the lower right hand corner. Um, kicks a can, he's so bored, he kicks a can and it 
hits a cat in a tree and it starts a whole series of events that one thing causes another, a chain of events that ex escalates, it gets bigger and bigger and more and more uh, chaotic. And you can see this in this spread, it's sort of midway through, uh, Peter got knocked down off her ladder and the baker slips and pies go out and, and hit, you know, hit people. And it, by the end of the book, the entire town is in chaos and people are falling down and everything is happening. And through it all, the boy is totally oblivious. He's still bored. He's walking through the whole town. His, um, his friend, this girl shows up and she's, she's sort of the foil. She is the one who sees what's going on. Well, I like that bird looking at the stick. What is that bird thinking? <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it was about. I think I had an idea and I'm not sure I can remember. I have to look at the book. And look. Maybe it was a wishbone. <laughs> Mark, I know you, you wrote this one yourself, but you've certainly worked with authors and this might be a question for um, everybody, but um, have there been times this came in from YouTube uh, when working on a children's book that you have requested to um, have a, a written change based upon how your artwork turned out. Is that something you're able to do to request a, a writing change? To request a what? A written? Change in the writing. Yeah. A change to an author's word. Oh, there, were, there was one. Um, oh, God, I don't know if I can say this. Um, it, it, it involved kind of a, a funny ra racial thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was one of the one of the snowplow books, and they uh, they they rescue they rescue one of the drivers who'd gone off the road, the snowplow and a tow truck, and um, the driver of that car that went off the road happened to be black, and when they when they bring him up, the original text said free at last. And I thought, oh my God. Um, so I wrote to the author and said, you have to change that to free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> so, but it was, it was better to just not just to have a different wor wording for that. But that was my only suggestion to change text. And did you, is that what we received? Did the change happen? Was that to me? Oh, Elwin, please go right ahead. Oh, no, I, I, I don't, to tell the truth, I, I, I can't remember the question. <laughs> no problem. Um, here's another beautiful spread. Okay, moving on. I really made a mistake going there with that. With that. <laughs> so this was the other book that I have written and it was, it's called Archie and the Pirates and it's kind of an adventure story. Um, Archie is the monkey up in the top right corner. Uh, he's shipwrecked on an island and he's kind of a combination of Robinson Crusoe and MacGyver. And he makes friends with a few of the animals and together they defeat a band of pirates. And um, uh, this is the last spread of the book when all of the animals who work together were decided that they would be great if they lived together in a town. So this is the, the town that they built. Beautiful drawing. Oh, back. It's a different oh. kind of children's book. This is ostensibly a children's book, but obviously not really. Uh, <laughs> it was written by Michael Ian Black, this really funny writer and performer. Um, and the, the thing about this book was, it was presented to me by Simon and Schuster in uh, early March of 2016, you know, when Trump was just saying that he was going to run for president and they and the publisher said you've got to do this book really fast um, it has to come out before the republican convention which was in july so it was like just a few months away normally as i said before books take a year or so to to put together if you've got to do this book in a month because um he's clearly not going to get the nomination and then this book will be of no interest to anybody so I, I did manage to get, get it done in the month. And um, sad to say that it, uh, the book is still of interest to some people. <laughs> he, he, the book was written very, very much like a doc, in, the, in the form of a Dr. Seuss book. Did you design it, Mark? 
Um, is it, there any graphic design on the cover? Um, no, no, there's a great, the art director, um, uh, Dan Potash from Simon & Schuster is a fabulous designer. And we knew there was gonna be some you know, image of him and he, and he came up with that. Uh, it's wonderful. It really has the feel of one of those old books of the period. So. Yeah. He, even he even distressed it, you know, made it look distressed. Mark, I, um, back in the 2016 primaries, I started, I was doing a lot of political cartoons um, and publishing them on Medium. And I was drawing all the candidates, but I would draw Trump and I drew him in short pants, shorts, because I felt like he's, he, he was a bully. I think I've seen um, him. And uh, I, I often put him in a sandbox with other the other GOP candidates. I, it was it was kind of fun to do that. Um, I, I took away the short pants when he became president for just out of respect for the office and um, giving him a chance. And I brought actually just recently brought the short pants back. So <laughs> it's commentary in and of itself. Liza, are you is this a way of asking? Um, Indirectly, how come Trump has no pants in this? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. Well, I was trying to think of a way to show him that it wasn't like a real, you know, out and out caricature or Dr. Seussian looking, because the book was very much Dr. Seuss. I didn't want to make yeah. it too much. So I guess just kept thinking of him as kind of a rutabaga or a sweet potato or something, you know, with hair. Well, all of your work is really wonderful, Mark, and I'm sure this one is still a hot ticket item for sure. Is that, is that digital, Mark? Is that is that also digital? It looks white. It was, it was drawn in pencil and shaded, you know, in pencil and then okay. colored digitally. Yeah. I love that it also has a Robert Osborne quality, the, the, those drawings, I thought. Very you nice. Know. Thank you, Mark. Wonderful. Roxy, I wonder if you could talk about your uh, journey in illustration and, and how you got there. Well, um, this, by the way, is one of my apps. That was one of my apps. Um, I did this huge maze, six, uh, five feet long, and it, um, it had 16 um, panels on it, and you went from panel to panel. Um, and so that picture, this picture is that. Um, I love doing mazes. So um, at the age of six, I was first published huh? <laughs> because I won a prize for a drawing. And I'm like, this is fun in the newspaper, the local newspaper. So I've been an artist all my life, and I used to be, a, I studied fine art, but I used to be a television courtroom artist in Washington, D.C., an editorial artist. And I started coming to New York to get freelance work and stopped in the New Yorker one day with a couple drawings, and they bought them, like, right then and there. Mm. And a couple years after that, I tried a cover idea, and they bought I came up on the train and they bought the cover and um, I was in Washington with a, a little house. I had an apartment. Oh, you have a, something I didn't realize. Um, a dog and a car and I gave all that up, moved to New York, didn't know one person. The day after they bought my first cover. So it, the New Yorker has been incredibly influential in my life. And the first cover is that one on the right there. Um, next slides. You can see where I get my uh, tendency towards mazes. <laughs> Absolutely, a lot of architecture and perspective. So, so interesting. Um, oh, so um, a few years ago, I was working on a children's product and um, these big, huge, almost stage set type things. And I did a maze. And then I thought, I wonder if I could do a ma mazes in a book. And I got the idea to do a maze that would go from page to page to page, you would never leave the maze. Of course, you couldn't go up. It was very tricky because you only have one solution to it. So I did the, the book and I came all the way to the end, but about actually about two thirds of the way through the book, um, I made a mistake in the book, right? And it turned me around. And I'm lying in bed that night, dream, you know, and in a dream, I literally dreamt that, wait a minute, I'll take that mistake I'll put it in the back of the book so that you go all the way through the book from page to page to page. And then at the end, you're turned around and you come all the way back through the book to your starting point on a different maze. And this is also an ABC book. Um, you search for, uh, this is the drawing, so you don't see it, but there's little signs that say A, B, and then coming back, you would be at the Z. Um, and this, 
this is a, there are letters in here that you may not be able to see. There's an F in the upper left, a V in the lower right, an E in the middle top. So there's an alphabet and also you count and find things within this book. And this is called Mayscapes. This is the first of six maze books uh, that I did, which I love to do. Next slide. So this actually is, so I started to, you know, I'm known more for my nonfiction and concept books using gamification, which is um, kind of using game-like devices and non-traditional uh, media. In other words, the book as object. I mean, it's not telling you how to play a game, it's the game. So they would be, lit. I've done lift the flap books, mazes, guessing games, inside outside concepts, search, a lot of search and find, matching games. Oh, you can go back, go back to that one for a second. Matching games, hidden objects. So this book is a nonfiction book because it talks about ecosystems. So 12 ecosystems and it's very, it's a little harder. It's harder to do mazes based on real life because you have to adhere to rules. You can't just do a bunch of fantasy things. Although in a minute we'll see some fantasy things. Um, and this is a way to understand 12 different ecosystems. So you have a game where you start at one point and end at the other. You search and find for the things. And even when I'm doing this book, I, I like put myself into it and I feel like I'm on the little teeny road. Um, and, and when I was doing this, I also, by executing it, started to grasp my own, you know, it teaches me about ecosystems. Like when I did tundra, I had to understand there are no trees there. They're just like little flowers and leaves. I mean, um, pieces of grass. So it's, um, it's very challenging, but it's exciting. For example, in a city, you'd think that would be a great maze, but walking on a sidewalk, you can't direct, you have to be very careful. You can't direct people because people could go either way. But on a road, you have lanes that are dictated. So there are various challenges to, um, to making mazes in real out of real life things. But you can go now. Uh, uh, Roxy, what, what medium do you use generally? I, uh, I use pen and ink. I do the whole thing. And by the way, in the back of the nonfiction books is an answer key. And so I do the black and white ink. So I don't know if you can see this. I do it in black and white ink. And then I scan the, the maze so that it can be used in the back either uh, for um, to find the answers. And then also I save it for children to, and put it on my web pages so that they can color them in. So it's an activity also. And I, so I use ink and then I use colored inks um, to paint them. And I really love them because you can do, as you'll see, very, very strong colors. I use something like F and W acrylic inks or very subtle colors. And if you use, I use primarily transparent. So A, the line shows through. And also if you put red and then you put Blue, you where they cross is like layers of glass. You'll find purple. So uh, I found it a wonderful um, medium. So this is so. After just finished saying I do nonfiction, <laughs> here we have my closest thing to fantasy. And here you come in on the left side and you work your way through the maze and you go out on the right side. And this is a series. I think I have three of them here of eight interconnected mazes, all on different different ideas, but they flow from one to another. You see the yellow path on the left and then it exits on the right. So next, so this is after Escher. This is called Tunnel Town. And uh, it was very challenging. You, you go upstairs, you go on an elevator, you go on a subway car, you go on a, a river down at the bottom and you work your way through the maze. Um, and again, Tunnel Town, and you can see it's not a tree house, it's the opposite because you see the roots of the trees. So next. Roxy, do you get a lot of response from children who are trying to find their way through these things or having fun, you know, kind of settling into the little spaces that you're, you're painting? And... Yes, and also um, 
my books have been chosen as the best books for boys off, often because even though I'm a girl and I love mazes and they say women are not as spatially oriented as men, I don't believe it because I'm a girl and I like mazes. But, but it's very good for, um, uh, again, this was chosen as particularly good for boys because it gives them fun using a book, particularly the nonfiction books like Ecosystems. It's a sneaky way to um, have children get engaged and interested and learn things. And by the way, this, this maze, which you come in on at the A and you work your way around, I've developed an entire 32 page architectural book on this, which is quite challenging because if you think about a book, you can't open it top and bottom unless the whole book's constructed that way. So from left to right. So if I moved through the city, the whole city would be one long skinny city, right? Because you can't, you know, if, if you move from page to page to page in a linear way. But I figured out a way where in several places by let's say having a green park and then it matches up with another, I created it so it's actually a regular, when you see it at the end, you can see that it's a regular city. It's not one long because you, in several transfer points, you work your way. Um, it's hard to describe. It took a year to figure it out. <laughs> Next. And this is my new book just out. It came out sadly enough the very day, April 7th at New York had its worst uh, day of COVID. So um, not a good time to have a book come out, but it's called Dive In, here's the cover. And this book um, has a huge, this is also a paper engineer book. It has a huge spread. Thank, thank you, my dear Holiday House publishers. <laughs> it has a huge spread in it. And in the end, you find out that you've been swimming, you never, and you do this, I don't know if you can see this, you're working your way from page to page. Again, this is like a puzzle. The top, the sides, they all fit into each other. So the fish at the top, for the fish on the right, for example, goes through three pages. So this is a game also. This is just out. And the next one is my new book, which hasn't even come out yet, um, about the rainforest. And again, you're taking a trip through the rainforest and every page leads into the next. And this is, does have some vertical connections. You'll see the tail of two um, golden tamarins hanging down. And, you, and above that was the, uh, their, their page, the monkey page. This is the iguana. And I love it that he looks so fierce. He's six feet long, but he actually is a vegetarian and he's a scaredy cat. He can run really fast and swim fast, but he's not vicious. He wouldn't hurt you. And then you've got him and then you've got the little teeny ants down below who are also vegetarians. So each page um, has a rationale. Uh, and then the text, this is just, um, this book has not been printed yet, as I say. So this was given to the art director. Uh, this is just a scan of the, um, of the book and this comes out next year. So, um, so again, uh, in these gamification books, as um, a children's literature uh, scholar said a couple of years ago, she said, I use the book as object. So the book itself is a thing and um, some more than others, but when you, they're, they're all interactive right from the get-go, like the inside outside books. When I looked upon, back upon it later, I realized they had elements of surprise, interactivity and page turn that starts to become a game. So, so that's what really interests me. And again, the challenge is to um, do it, like I did a book to, to do it with um, nonfiction. It's very easy to make fantasy, fantasy things, not easy, but easier. For instance, here's a book called Market Maze, where you start out, in, let's say in Montauk, you start out at the sea and you work your way through the mountains and you pick up apples and then you pick up tomatoes and then you get to the cornfields and you work your way all through from page to page until you get to the city. And <laughs> then you go to the green market. So this is teaching children where food comes from. And there's a guessing game. So each environment, like the apple environment would also have other things like um, the animals that might live in that area. Uh, so again, it's teaching, but also 
playing games at the same time. And, and one more quick thing I wanted to say when we talked earlier about rejection. So I did one book, which is also a guessing book called Masterpiece Mix a couple of years ago for Holiday House. This book I had started in 1995 or something. An editor suggested I do a book on art. I did it. I did a dummy. She rejected it out of hand. I put it in my flat files for 12 years or more. And then I took the idea to Holiday House about four years ago and they, they bought it. So you never know. This too has a game element. In the end, you have to find all the, there are 37 paintings that are like hidden away within this. And of course it teaches kids about art, genres of art. So uh, again, that's my mantra, you know, never give up. <laughs> Amazing, amazing work and a great uh, opportunity for interactivity for kids. We have a question um, that actually, Roxy, probably would be great for you to answer, but I think it could apply to everybody. Um, the question is, uh, do you conceptually uh, come up with your own ideas and also how long does it take to uh, actually create the finished product? Uh, actually, I, I do have a thought on that. Um, a, I always come up with my same ideas and my own ideas. And also one book will lead into another. You'll notice I did the rainforest in maze, uh, eco mazes. And now I'm doing a whole book on rainforest. Or you saw that ABC, I'm doing a whole book on that. So you often get one idea uh, after the other. But um, also um, the other part of your, second part of your question. Oh, I, oh, I know what I was thinking. So with, with with me, I'm what's called a visual thinker. So I actually do the drawings and the concept first to see if it works. And then I write the words, which my editors do not like. They want you to write the words first so that they can edit it and give it back to you. And then you can do the dummy or the sketches. So I have to train my editors if possible um, to let me do the art first. And then I write to the art. I don't do the art to the writing. I write to the art. Roxy, we have another question from YouTube. Mark had mentioned that he, uh, for his Trump book, he, he did it in a month, but generally it's a year or two for a book. Um, how long do you spend on your books? Well, if you don't count 12 years in a drawer, <laughs> <laughs> I spend about a year, about okay. the same, yeah. And then it's one more year before it comes out by the time they print it. And after, you know, by that time, you've kind of forgotten you did it. <laughs> I, I have usually question. about a year. I, I have a question. Roxy, are, are you good at mazes? Do you go, have you been in <laughs> mazes or do you draw mazes for yourself or figure out mazes? Well, I actually doodle. We talked about doodling when I'm on the phone, like even I'm not doing it now, but half the time when I'm listening to a webinar, I'm doodling. But as a child, I remember in our backyard, um, I think we were building something with bricks, like a, a patio or something. And I made a circular house with the bricks, which was a maze. Um, but I don't do, a, I don't particularly solve other people's mazes. Ah. So, you know, I just like making them. <laughs> ah. Roxy, thank you. It was really wonderful to learn more about these incredible books. Really beautiful. And Elwood, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started? You've got a, you've got a great uh, story behind your uh, beginnings. You, you mean with Nancy Feind or? Yeah. I, I, uh, school. I didn't know I would talk about that, but my, my high school uh, art teacher was Nancy Fine, and I, I had two years of high school with it. I didn't go to take art because uh, uh, I thought I would do, my father suggested I do drafting. I could make a living doing you know, draftsmen uh, back when they actually used pencils and all those things. And um, so I took drafting for two years. In the third year, I couldn't take drafting because my grades were too low. So they sent me down. To, to take something else. And uh, so I thought, oh, I'll have to take art. And I didn't want to take it because I didn't like the art teacher. But I walked in the room and it was a new art teacher, I had just come from New York City. And her name is Nancy Boyer Feint. And I would say she was my mentor. She was the person who I didn't know at the time that would turn my world around and introduce me to uh, all kinds of other artists than Norman Rockwell and all the cartoonists I loved. So uh, I, I always have to say when I give a talk or something that 
uh, I really owe her a, a great dad. And uh, uh, I stayed in touch with her over the years, dedicated two kids books to her. And uh, another of her students, Jean Ryman and I uh, were there two weeks before she died of cancer, uh, visited her. So uh, that's quite an aside, but something like that in your life, I got nurturing from my parents uh, when I would draw a little Porky Pig or something that looked kind of like Porky Pig. But it wasn't until Nancy Fine that it, did it um, enrich my life in so many ways that only later did I appreciate it as my life unfolded. Uh, so that was, uh, she insisted that I leave Alpena, Michigan, my hometown, and go to art school once I graduated and found a school in Chicago, Chicago Academy of Fine Arts, which was a mediocre school. Mm -hmm. but it was a place to spend two years and uh, uh, learn a few things. And then I went out and after that, it's pretty much self-taught, just art director for eight years. And then I started illustration full time in the 70s or what. Well. I, I so lose track of time. Maybe it was so this is a fairly early piece. Do you want to say a little bit about this? Yeah. Uh, I never had a, the gift uh, of a style. Uh, I wasn't uh, a lot of younger artists. You see their work when they first start in the biz, and that style is kind of their style. It may morph a bit. And I struggled with all kinds of things. I love Seymour Quast and Arl Blackman. There were so many influences. Uh, Alan Colbert. So I would try aping these people, but I'm not very skilled at that. And it was a blessing, I guess, because I never could, but I couldn't find my footing until I remembered of the, the things I grew up with in the Detroit Free Press, which were like Barney Google. And I mean, I was born in 41, so you can sort of, I grew up with the comics of the 40s and, and the Saturday Evening Post of the 40s and on through the 50s. And uh, so, I, I, I came up with, this is a more, this is that style that I came up with after I moved to Manhattan in 1976. Around 77, I discovered in a way my roots and I started studying the artists, Martin Jeff and these, these people that drew in a certain way that I loved. And I tried to figure out what they did with their pens to make that magic happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, uh, I'm pointing over here because that's where my image is, but uh, this is one of those, and I was never known as a, gra a real graphic kind of person. I always had a lot of stuff going on, but this, I think, was the first cover I did, and it's the Chicago Tribune. I even wrote down here the, the date uh, on it. Uh, let's see. It's kind of dark in here. You probably can't even see me. 1983. So I did this cover. And at the time, uh, my late wife and I had, had Scotty's. So I'm, I'm with the Scotty there and I'm, I'm reading The Hound of the Baskervilles and down there is a canine mutiny. Uh, but I, uh, I would write these, um, uh, create these little stories. And this was a cover that led to me doing a whole bunch of covers for a while. Uh, I, I've never done a lot of covers, but I started doing it for Detroit Free Press. and. Uh, uh, West Magazine did some nice things for them. I like doing, uh, like Way Out West, uh, I created a musical um, and uh, put it on locally in Rhinebeck and, and it was called Grumpy Lou and His Kazoo and I wrote all the songs and uh, 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 Maggie Picard, my late wife, uh, wrote the book, did the, the story for it and had the band that Stephanie knows, the Polecats, I don't think they were known as the Polecats then, uh, but that was the, made, we made the music. We had work projected with an old fashioned projector and that was loads of fun. And I love doing little posters like that when I'm the art director. It's so much fun with no one making changes. That one is a, a greeting card. Oops, on oh, the right. Right. A, a, a greeting card. Mm -hmm. And I, I did, I've done greeting cards for several greeting card companies and they, they never sold very well, um, but for the company I did these for, I really think I did some nice ones. Uh, Gravity doesn't exist. Yeah, this is uh, something that I <clears throat> uh, that I I love um, working on. This was uh, who who is that? Uh, uh, Dennis uh, Overby does the New York Times science section. 
And he loved my work. He recommended me to the art director. Uh, and so I did quite a few for him, both individual spots and some of these larger pieces. This is one of my real favorites. And, and the story is just basically about people who have an idea that gravity doesn't exist. I mean, that it, not as we know it, you know, how these, there are these strange things that happen. And uh, so it was fun to have gravity not working and hmm. managed to keep him on the ground because he's, he has, he has a newspaper. Anyway, I, I love these kind of drawings where I take all my favorite things I like to draw because there are lots of things I don't draw well and don't like drawing. I, I'm a, just limited in what I like, but like shopping bags I like and guitars. And Alwood, I want to interrupt you for a sec because there's an amazing question from YouTube, uh, which may, maybe will make you a little less self-effacing. Um, <laughs> a very popular, iconic Nickelodeon style in some of your work. Who influenced who? Oh, so. <laughs> uh, who, who's the other who? <laughs> uh, uh, Nickel, well, actually, we could elevate. Um, uh, no. I was, uh, you know, as I said, I was influenced by the early cartoonists. Uh, yeah. Some people have said my work feels more like R. Crumb, but I was not a fan of his until later. So I, I didn't like his work. I didn't follow his work. So he and I drew from the same well, you know. And I think this viewer is suggesting that sort of modern Nickelodeon uh, looks a lot like some of your work. So the, oh. the, the flow well, continues. If it's modern, <laughs> then, they're, then they're copying me. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. That's the idea. <laughs> um, th this was for, the one on the left was for uh, Fred Woodward, I think of uh, West Magazine. I, I can't remember if that's what it was. But it was about the Texas Navy. <clears throat> and I just thought it was funny. I mean, Texas does have coasts, but the idea that the Navy would be plowing through a, the, you know, a, a desert kind of theme. And the one on the right uh, was for a magazine. And I couldn't find which magazine it was in my stuff to look it up. But it was loads of fun because I got to write. And accompanying each one of these is a make-believe thing. Like I, I, I would read a, about a real inventor or someone and then I would create my own scenario for it and it would have type under it. And, and that's a Da Vinci device of some kind uh, that, I, that, I, that I created uh, looking at some of the things Da Vinci did, of course. Anyway, it was, uh, that's a Pope of some kind up there. And it was, uh, I, I really love, this is a, <laughs> certain works of mine, I just love looking at them. I think they're just so good. It's almost like someone else did it. A lot of my work, I'm, it looks like someone else that did it that, whose work I don't like. <laughs> oh, I like these. Um, on, the, on the left is, um, I started embracing Photoshop and uh, adding, I didn't draw digitally, but I would draw manually like that, that uh, woman is drawn in, in my line with my normal pens in, in just line. And then I would scan it and bring it in and I would bring in watercolor swatches from my little splash thing off to the side. I would bring that in like on her dress and then find images, either copyright free ones, or I would sometimes buy the rights to certain images. And I did a number of pieces like that. And I'm, I'm very pleased with the way they turn out. They had a more graphic look. And uh, the one on the right is, uh, it's on some of her mugs around the house when I have, I don't think I have one right now, when I have coffee. Um, I just did some things I like. I, I've always had cats in my life since, you know, almost my entire life. And uh, they sometimes give you that look when you <laughs> don't get up in time. And in case people can't see it, the, uh, the title is The Late Breakfast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And so, Elwood, how did you, how did you move into picture books? Um, I started off when I first got to, to Manhattan in 76, I, I took my portfolio to everyone who would look at it. And in those days, people looked at it. Some of the people warned me in the Midwest that the art directors would chew you up, New York art directors, it's a rough town. I never met such wonderful embracing people uh, as the art directors and some of the editors. Uh, when I went to the city, they would uh, get their Rolodex. If they couldn't use me, they'd give me names of other people. It was, it was great. But I went to a number of publishers of kids' books and uh, 
they didn't, they, almost everybody liked my portfolio, which was an actual old fashioned portfolio with 12 matted pieces in it. And uh, so I didn't get any work. So I, I started doing just uh, editorial work for all the magazines and newspapers and, uh, and a fair amount of advertising at the time. Uh, and uh, then as, that, as those things started diminishing because of the times were changing, uh, I, uh, I, I got offers to do kids books. And uh, so for a long time, I illustrated other uh, uh, people who wrote, like Susan Goodman on this one, uh, she did both of these books, The a Truth About Poop is the first one. And it was really, um, a, 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 it was quite a bit of fun because she's a good writer and she's funny and she did good research. So it wasn't a scatological kind of book. It was, it was factual, but she had humor. And then I could augment it with whatever I did. So um, yeah, anyway, so that's how I got into doing it. Uh, it just became what was available and um, I had mixed feelings about it. I like doing them, but I, I, I've always been protective and <clears throat> hate making changes and uh, editors make changes. You know, that's their job is to get it as they think is right. And they don't like stubborn people like me that <laughs> think, I, th I always thought I was doing it right. Um, that stalling book is nice. And that's all done uh, hand-drawn, but brought into Photoshop and then put together with that. Um, it, it, I, I could get more graphic with that than I could when I did the more manual drawing in the old days, I think. Helen, would you raise an, uh, an interesting question which might apply to everybody, I'm assuming. How hard is it to have to make changes that are suggested by an editor that you wouldn't necessarily agree with? Is that you know, it really, I'll just answer that it, I mean, for me, it's, it's because um, I'm stubborn and I, I know other illustrators and designers who make changes easily. They're, they're uh, more generous and they're more, I think, open and uh, they, they have, they're, they're just not as protective. They, they see it as something they're doing for the good of the book. It's like musicians, they say, when you, when you play guitar, you play for the song, you don't overplay. And uh, I, I I never could find the way. All the years I was in the business, I was always uh, struggling um, to you know, get it my way and, and having to give in. And I, I don't know, I, I don't want to talk about it too much because it makes it seem like I was a malcontent. <laughs> I'm kind of not, I, I don't think, but I, um, and I look at my body of work and it's, there's some really nice stuff in there, but uh, I, I, the stuff I'm doing now is when I'm happiest, so. Uh, I'd like to quickly say that, that it, for me, it depends totally on the art director and the type of changes. There uh, are art directors that, I did, I did some work with Art Spiegelman with the art director, and what he said, I just said, yeah, okay. I mean, when you sense that they know what they're doing and it could improve it, I'm totally willing. And then yeah. the other ones are kind of dumb or useless changes. It's like, I'll fight to keep what I did. Yeah, and if they're kind of sweethearts about it, they're really nice, and they, you know, that they're they're softening you up, but you can't help but love it, and so that makes it easier too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, would you do some work for um, the Klutz collection? Which, the what? The Klutz, the, the collection. Oh, of yeah, books. yeah. That that was something that actually my my partner Janice was. was saying, well, don't forget about the Klutz books, which I almost had kind of forgotten about because I haven't done anything for them for so long. But in the early days, and I, I wrote down uh, here uh, uh, a, a name that I, that I wanted to mention because it, it's just like one of those sort of important things. Um, uh, let's see, it was, um, I, I actually forgotten the people because it's been so long, but I did a lot of books for them, like this jump rope book and they, they were ideal clients in the early days. It was John Cassidy who created that uh, juggling book with those soft juggling things. Uh, and it had a, a bag attached and that was his first book. And then he got the company going. And not long after he started, I, I just read, because the, the art director we worked with was Mary Ellen Podgorski. And she was, they both were ideal people to work with. They gave me a lot of freedom. And when the, something didn't work, they, they let me know in a way that seemed to work 
for me. Um, something like the Jump Rope book, I got to design the whole thing uh, with probably, uh, Mary Ellen probably came in and, and changed sizes of things. But anyway, uh, that, that was really a delight. And I had a good run with them for a long time. And then someone bought them out, a big company bought them out. They changed our director. Oh, and Mary Ellen sadly died quite young of, of cancer. And uh, so we lost her. Then they changed everything around. John Cassidy sold, sold business. And, and they, they only used me a couple times after that. And I kind of didn't want to work with them anyway, because it was just so much fun in those early days. That was a great client, I'll say. It's probably fairly typical that maybe when an editor or art director you're associated with changes, that that can change the relationship with the company. Too. Yeah, I'm sure everyone here that's worked over a prolonged period will so, you know, you have your favorites and people that you sometimes you have a long-term relationship with. And um, these are, this one is finally my book. And that's one that sat in drawers. Uh, so, so, like, so like Roxy, you know, where they just didn't go anywhere. And occasionally we'd bring them out and dust them off and send, send them to someone who seemed inter interested in something. And finally uh, uh, it, it got sold by, um, by who? Um, I, uh, it's creative company. And Rita Marshall's the art director. Uh, sh she's married to Etienne Delessaire, if anybody knows his absolutely fabulous work. He's so original. And uh, Tom Peterson is the publisher. And, and Tom actually, she sh uh, Rita showed my, my, the dummy of my book to him, this book. And, uh, or actually it was a different one. And, and he, he said, yeah, let's go with it. And then, then this book. So. Uh, it was fun, and of course, did the thing with the Norman Rock when we see him in this. I did a drawing class, uh, very loosey goosey. I'd, I'd like to try it again. Maybe I could even do, approach it differently. Uh, you know, we've got some good questions. Thank you, Elwood. It's incredible to see your wonderful work. Thank you. And we've got some interesting questions from our audience. Um, from Brian Bose, a few folks have talked about. Uh, bouncing between media, uh, particularly digital and traditional. What are some of the benefits and or pitfalls of that back and forth? Um, anybody have a thought on that? Well, it's a lot easier to make changes in digital media <laughs> than watercolors. <laughs> right, so it's the difference between being able to change something or having to start over, I guess. Yeah, uh, at the very tail end, we may don't have time, but I had a couple of my newer pieces if we could glance yeah, at. Yeah, we're gonna get right to that. So these are things that you're actually doing just for yourself. Yeah, this is the stuff. And you can see that it's, it's informed by my whole body of work over the years, but I'm stretching and trying to get into, it, it's my personal art and I think it's the best work I've ever done. And one could argue, that my career is based on being an illustrator, but I uh, this is this is where I do whatever I want with no editorial input and um, and explore and try to stretch and uh, it's it's a it's a great a great joy to do uh, at the tail end of my career and life. So, anyway. Well, but I know you've been developing a program that gets other people to draw. Uh, based upon using simple shapes yeah. uh, as well. Yeah, well, that's the one I, how to draw with your funny bow, and I was leaning on that a bit, but I would like to revisit that sometime via the Rockwell Museum to, to The idea was that everybody drew, all of us, whether we turned out to be artists or not, we all drew when we were little kids. We got it down on our hands and knees and we made pictures that were all somewhat similar. <clears throat> And then as we got older, we started giving over that joy to people who could draw something that looked like a thing, uh, or they would draw Superman that looked like Superman. And it always seemed wrong to me that as people be, you know, get toward retirement age or whatever, they, they, they take a watercolor class or something, and I'm not putting down watercolor classes or anything, but they, they try it and, it, and it, it's hard to do right. And, uh, I, I would like sometime to find a way to encourage them to make pictures. I mean, I have skills, so I've developed skills like this, but 
if they could draw like they did when they were little kids, some of that's the best art I've ever seen is what little kids do. So anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, great I, I Thank you for sharing your work. Um, we, uh, we're just gonna close with a couple more questions and maybe I'll invite everybody to jump in on maybe one or the other that might be of interest to you. Um, so we have two questions. One is, what, how would you advise uh, young artists who are coming into the field uh, at this stage? And then are there things that you're working on now that you are excited about and might want to mention? Anybody want to take one of those questions? Yeah, I'd love to show what I'm doing now, actually. Um, in terms of illustration, I'm, I'm doing a postcard for the uh, kids from, from Florida who did uh, who, the gun control stuff. And there's a series of postcards that um, various illustrators are gonna do based on massacres, uh, gun massacres. So this is from Indiana, there's a famous horrifying massacre and they're taking those traditional postcards uh, and wow. using the inside of the letter, the way they did those things. You know, yeah, I love, I love those. With those. Like, like a little comic strip of, of the, the massacre. I, yeah. Something hasn't, hasn't happened yet. But this is a printout of this last one. How will they be circulated, Mark? I think October. So they're going to come out, and, and they're they're I think they're going to be they're going to be sent to people in Congress to try to get them to stand up to the NRA. Great. Are you in conversation with those amazing young people as part of this? Is that no, no, not well. Just uh, you know the person who's organizing this. Mm -hmm. But you know, I would love to be. Yeah. Really fun. Um, I'll, I'll share, uh, it's show and tell, it's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> uh, as, as, as Stephanie mentioned every day at five on Instagram's TV, I, I started this during the pandemic uh, in March. I started live drawing um, at five uh, and I put this device over my hand and I just draw uh, the camera. I talk to the camera first and, I, and I talk to the, the audience. And then I draw for them, and I'm and I'm not drawing anything in particular necessarily. Sometimes it's just doodling or talking about what's going on, drawing the healthcare workers and the and the people in the front lines, and, and talking about how we're struggling with it. Just no script, no nothing. And then um, and then I did Black Lives Matter, and then now I'm still doing it every day at five for Instagram. And I today I drew um, the the Jacob Blake who uh, was shot in Milwaukee, and um, mm. I. That's also, beautiful. Thank you. Also experimenting with uh, materials and, and people like to see me experiment. They like to see, like this is a, this is a Japanese brush I just discovered I had and, and I love the way it, it works with the ink. So that's all on paper pretty much. Um, and then I do digital, digital drawings, um, like live drawing, uh, like the convention tonight and the convention last week. So I do those and put them on Twitter. So it's an for me, it's a new way to interact with my audience. <clears throat> and um, right now I'm not getting any money for this, but that's okay. It's, it's a way to, to, to get my name out there and get my work out there and talk to people and, and share. Thank you. Well, I, I'm doing a series of um, oil paintings a little bit based upon the city during the coronavirus in New York. There were, the streets were kind of empty for a long time. Mm -hmm. and you'd see a solitary person walking by. So I'm doing a series of oils and I paint around the corners, which kind of works with architecture. So yeah. here's, you know, here's a single person. So That's I've good. done a series of nine of these, very gra more graphic than my usual things. Yeah. Beautiful, are they intended for exhibition, Roxy, or for public? Yeah, yeah, they go to either gallery, several galleries, but the main one is up in Provincetown and I'm, trying to dry the oil off because oil takes so long and I'll be shipping them out in a couple uh, by the middle of next week for Labor Day weekend. Great. So you can see they're, you know, they're all lined up over there kind of trying to dry as a fan I'm fanning. <laughs> well, you all have done amazing work and incredible careers and we look forward to uh, seeing next steps and, and all the projects you continue to do. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been wonderful to hear your work. And we thank our audience for being part of it and coming up with such great questions. 
we will look forward to seeing you again soon. We actually have another wonderful program next Tuesday at 5.30 with four female cartoonists. And Liza, I wonder if you want to say a little bit about that for just a... Oh, sure. Um, next Tuesday, we have a panel of cartoonists who are women for, for the New Yorker. It'll be um, Roz Chast, Victoria Roberts, um, Emily um, Hopkins, uh, Emily Richards Hopkins, and um, uh, Sarah Lautman. So it's a, a diverse group of people, diverse styles, and, and we're going to talk about our work and talk about what it's like to be a, a woman in a in a field that's been historically dominated by guys. Mm -hmm. what, and what that what is that about? So <laughs> it'll be a fun conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. thank you all for your, your extraordinary contributions to the lives of children. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Right. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks again. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. See you, Mark. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go. I'm going to get on your porch. On the street.